friends and colleagues today we will talk about one of the most recent topics in nephrology which is uh, c3 glomerulopathy this is our agenda glomerular diseases uh, associated with abnormalities of the complement system include tma thrombotic microangiopathy and glomerular nephritis activation of complement in most of the cases in most of the cases is secondary due to immune complex deposition is in most of the cases it is secondary to immune complex deposition however in a small number of patients or cases abnormalities of the complement system itself itself causes glomerular nephritis that the abnormality of the complement causes glomerular nephritis not that the immune complex causes activation of the complement as uh, in most of the cases which is when the abnormality of the complement system causes glomerular nephritis is our topic today These abnormalities in complement might be in classic pathway or in the alternative pathway. An important example of abnormalities in the classic complement pathway abnormality which causes glomerular nephritis is C1Q nephropathy or C1Q deficiency. C1Q nephropathy C1Q is an early component of the of the classic complement pathway which causes a lupus like manifestations and usually with nephrotic syndrome but most of the cases which are due to complement abnormality due to complement abnormality it is mainly in the alternative pathway that this the problem is in the alternative pathway which causes complement activation and glomerular deposition of C3 with absence with absence this is very important in our definition absence of immunoglobulin deposition in glomeruli only C3 it is now termed C3 glomerulopathy C3 glomerulopathy which is our topic today it is due to abnormality in the alternative pathway again c3 glomerulopathy c3 glomerulopathy is a recent issue in nephrology characterized by glomer it's an glomerulus characterized by accumulation of c3 in glomeruli c3 in glomeruli due to abnormal control of the alternative complement pathway this is the pathogenesis which we will talk in, about it in details now <coughs> what what is characteristic for c3 glomerulopathy is strong immunohistological staining for c3 strong c3 staining in the glomeruli without immunoglobulins or c1q or c4 only c3 deposition without immunoglobulins nor c1q or c4 this is c3 glomerulopathy what about definitions this is very important what about the definitions c3 glomerulopathy again c3 glomerulopathy is characterized by dominant c3 deposition in glomeruli with electron dense deposits on electron microscope it is defined into two three types dense deposit disease dense deposit disease which is a form of c3 glomerulopathy characterized by this is very important for definitions and differential diagnosis dense deposit disease is characterized by intensely osmiophilic transformation 
of the glomerular basement membrane later we will see the photo it's very important what what is very characteristic for dense deposit disease is electron microscopy it is on electron microscopy appearance of intensely intensely osmophilic transformation of the gbm this is characteristic for density deposit disease what about c3 glomerulonephritis it is another type of c3 glomerulopathy without this is to differentiate without the characteristic appearance of density deposit disease so in both of them there is c3 deposition in the glomeruli but to differentiate by electron microscopy density deposit disease has this characteristic appearance of intensely osmophilic transformation of the GBM and C3 glomerulonephritis lacks this appearance on electron microscopy. Another entity is glomerulonephritis with dominant, dominant C3. Take care of the terminology, dominant. What is dominant? It is a case of glomerulonephritis with dominant staining for C3. What is dominant? This is important. Dominant is defined as C3 complement deposition intensity in the, glomerul in, in the glomeruli. That the deposition in the glomeruli, deposition intensity is two or more, two or more orders of magnitude more than any other immune reactant so dominant is intensity of two or more orders of magnitude more than any other immune reactant in the glomeruli on a scale from zero to three most of the, these cases with dominant c3 deposition are forms of c3 glomerulopathy so we have dense deposit disease, we have C3 glomerulonephritis, we have glomerulonephritis with dominant C3. Now let's talk about the etiology and pathogenesis. Let's talk about activation of complement in general. We have three pathways for complement activation. We have classic pathway, we have mannose binding lectin pathway and we have the alternative pathway. The crucial step or the common step or the common pathway for the three pathways is activation of complement three, C3 activation of complement three from the alternative, from the mannose binding, man binding lectin or the classic pathway. Classic pathway usually starts with C1Q, as we just described two slides before. C1Q binds to immunoglobulins, forming immune complex. Immune complex binds to C1Q in the presence of C4, C2, leads to complement uh, classic pathway activation, and C3 convertase acts on C3. What about the alternative pathway? Here, circulating C3B binds to activating surface, usually bacterial polysaccharides, leads to C3 convertase acting on C3. Mannose binding lectin usually binds to bacterial cell wall and activation of C3. C3 is then uh, divided to C3A, C3P, C3P. Opsonization and C5 leads to uh, at the end to membrane attack complex. What about C3 glomerulopathy in particular? The pathogenesis of C3 glomerulopathy is mainly due to dysregulation, dysregulation of the alternative pathway as we described so the main pathogenesis or abnormality 
which causes C3 glomerulopathy is abnormality or dysregulation of the alternative pathway of complement. In healthy people, the alternative pathway is con constantly being activated but a very slow rate. So usually in normal population, in most of us, there is continuous activation at a very low rate of the alternative pathway. Because this activation or amplification can progress so rapidly, we need very efficient, very efficient system to prevent, to prevent inappropriate activation of the pathway. For simplification, we need breaks. We need breaks to stop or to prevent inappropriate or overactivation of the pathway. The most important regulator or controller or breaker of the alternative pathway is factor H, complement factor H. This is very important. Complement factor H is the most important regulator, regulator or controller of the alternative pathway. بالعربي ده هو الفرامل البريكس بتاعت اللي بتمنع اوفر اكتيفيشن للالترناتيف باثواي مهم جدا كومبلمنت فاكتور اتش وي ويل ستارت تو توك ان ديتيلز اباوت كومبلمنت فاكتور اتش اند كومبلمنت فاكتور اتش ريليتد بروتينز and their role in pathogenesis of C3 glomerulopathy. Complement factor H is a glycoprotein made mainly in the liver, composed of protein subunit termed short consensus repeat domain. It is a glycoprotein formed of protein subunits termed short consensus repeat domains. The activity of complement factor H can be modulated by a group of closely related protein termed complement factor H related proteins. Very important. We talk about complement factor H and complement factor H related protein. What are these complement factor H related proteins? They control the activity or modulate the activity of complement factor H. There are five complement factor H related proteins in humans from complement factor H related protein one to five. Uh, we, are, we talk about complement factor H and then about complement factor H related protein, which controls the activity or the function of complement factor H. What is the function or the role of complement factor H related protein? What is their role? they are able to compete with the binding of complement factor H to C3B. Again, we, we talk that complement factor H is the regulator or the inhibitor or which prevent the activation of the complement pathway. But how, how complement factor H prevent this overactivation through binding to C3B. We saw it before that the alternative alternative pathway starts with C3B binding to bacterial polysaccharides. So complement factor H bind to C3B prevents overactivation. But complement factor H related proteins compete with complement factor H through this binding. Yeah, uh, complement factor H prevent the function of complement complement factor H related proteins prevent the function of complement factor H. This will lead to this complement factor H related protein when they bind to C3B. This interaction leads to or prevent the complement factor H from negatively regulating C3 production.
it inhibit inhibit complement factor H function. So it will prevent common factor H from negatively regulating C3B production. Consequently, this will lead to C3 amplification and overactivation. For simplification, complement factor H, complement factor H is the break or the regulator, or the pheromone. هي الفرامل اللي بتوقف ال بت prevent the overactivation. The complement factor H related proteins بت inhibit the فرامل دي بت بوازها. And this will lead to overactivation of the complement pathway. يبقى complement factor H related proteins act against complement factor H. This will lead to overactivation or amplification of C3B and overactivation of the alternative pathway in general. This over C3B amplification will lead to C3 glomerulopathy. In many cases of C3 glomerulopathy, as we described in the pathogenesis, that there is failure of complement factor H to control the activation of the alternative pathway. This will lead to low levels of circulating, circulating C3. Low levels or consumed circulating in the circulation C3 is consumed because of uncontrolled consumption. In this overactivation of the complement, this will lead to low C3. This low C3 in the circulation is present in up to 80% in patient of density deposit disease, in 80% of patients with density deposit disease, and 50% of patients with C3 glomerulonephritis have low levels of serum C3. So decrease the C3 in serum or circulation is present in 80% of density deposit disease patients and 50% of patients with C3 glomerulonephritis. The second one in the pathogenesis of C3 glomerulopathy we will talk about is C3 nephritic factor. C3 nephritic factor. We talk about complement factor H complement factor H and complement factor H related proteins. The second one is C3 nephritic factor. What are C3 nephritic factors? They are autoantibodies, autoantibodies that stabilize C3 convertase that stabilize C3 convertase of the alternative pathway by preventing complement factor H from carrying out its normal function. This is a second mechanism. The first mechanism of complement factor H related protein that they bind to C3B, preventing complement factor H from doing its function. Another mechanism is done by C3 nephritic factor. C3 nephritic factors, they are autoantibodies, autoantibodies that make C3 convertase, which is the target of complement factor H. not respond to complement factor H or stable for complement factor H. بالعربي هيخلي complement factor H ما يعرفش يشتغل على C3 convertase بيبقى حصل له resistance يبقى ال auto antibodies C3 nephritic factors directed against ال enzyme اللي هو C3 convertase making it resistant to the action of complement factor H. يعني خلى الفرامل ما تشتغلش. This will lead to overactivation of the complement pathway. C3 nephritic factors can be identified in 40 to 60% of cases of C3 glomerulonephritis and 80 to 90% of cases of dense deposit disease. However, however, C3 nephritic factors, 
can be present with other forms of glomerulonephritis and even in healthy patients they are not pathognomonic for c3 glomerulonephritis this is very important they can be present in other forms of gm and even in healthy population Is there a rule or a, a, another mechanism for C3 glomerulopathy? Yes. There might be complete, complete factor H deficiency. There is deficiency of complete factor H itself. Secondary to gene deletion or mutations, another mechanism or mutation of complement factor H, not deficiency, mutation in complement factor H that interfere with its binding to C3B and the mutation, mutation in C3, not in complement factor H, mutation in C3 that it change its structure so that it cannot be inhibited by complement factor H. So these are another mechanisms. In some patients, in some patients, there might be also autoantibodies directed against complement factor H itself. So there might be complement factor H deficiency due to gene deletion, or there is another mechanism is mutation of complement factor H, or mutation of C3, or autoantibodies to complement factor H itself. All of these are methods or explanations for C3 glomerulopathy. Now we will talk about a special pattern of C3 glomerulopathy. It is called complement factor H related type, one of the complement factor H related protein. In some cases, in some cases of C3 glomerulopathy, they might be not associated with excessive excessive activation of C3 in the circulation. Not associated. So in the circulation, there is no excessive activation. And it is assumed that, that the abnormality of or the overactivation of the alternative pathway is locally present within the glomerulus. This overactivation is only in the glomerulus, not in systemic circulation. This form of localized form of C3 glomerulopathy in the kidney, the example is a familial form of C3, it's a familial form, termed complement factor H related protein 5 nephropathy complement factor H related protein 5 nephropathy it is characterized by without systemic there is no systemic C3 activation very important the activation the activation is locally present in the kidney not in the systemic circulation it's a common cause of kidney disease in Cyprus. The summary of the pathogenesis of C3 glomerulopathy is that complement factor H rule, it is the most important regulator or it prevents the activation of the alternative pathway this is the normal rule of the complement factor H. Here the abnormality in C3 glomerulopathy is inhibition of complement factor H. This will lead to overactivation of the alternative pathway. This inhibition of complement factor H, this will lead to overactivation of the alternative pathway, which can be done through complement factor H related protein which prevent complement factor H from doing its function on C3B, or C3 nephritic factors, which are autoantibodies that are directed, that make 
C3B more resistant to the function of complement factor H, or this inhibition or decreased function of complement factor H might be due to deficiency due to gene deletion or due to mutation in complement factor H or autoantibodies directed against complement factor H. And don't forget this is specific form of complement factor H related protein 5, which is characterized by that this activation of the alternative is why is present only locally in the kidney, not in the systemic circulation. It's present in Cyprus. This is also a figure describing the pathogenesis of different C3 glomerulopathies, which leads to the end is abnormal C3 convertase activity might be due to antibodies to C3 convertase, and the best example is the C3 nephritic factor, as we said, or antibodies to complement regulators, and the most important here is complement factor H, or mutations, mutation in these regulators, as we described complement factor H, mutation in complement factor H, or allele variant in factor H, or mutation in the complement itself, making it more resistant to the action of these regulators. Now, what about the epidemiology of C3 glomerulopathy? Density deposit disease have a prevalence of 2 to 3 per million population. Density deposit disease is usually a disease of children and young adults usually a disease of children and young adult however in a series in 2009 from new york 39 percent 39 percent of adult patients were over 60 years of age density uh, deposit disease usually affecting males and females equally but some studies have sh have shown a female predominance in a large series from France, the ratio of C3 glomerulonephritis, C3 glomerulonephritis to density deposit disease is approximately 2 to 1, with a higher incidence for C3 glomerulonephritis. And patients were in C3 glomerulonephritis usually were older than patients in density deposit disease, with a mean age at diagnosis of 30 years. So the age in C3 glomerulonephritis is usually older. C3 glomerulonephritis frequency is usually more than density deposit disease. What about clinical manifestations? We will start by dense deposit disease, the clinical manifestations of dense deposit disease. Almost all patients, almost all patients have proteinuria this is the most important presentation usually with hematuria the proteinuria is nephrotic range is nephrotic range in two-thirds of patients and frank nephrotic syndrome in 12 to 65 percent in different series so the main presentation is proteinuria and usually it is nephrotic range proteinuria and full blown nephrotic syndrome. Decreased kidney function is common. Decreased kidney function is common at presentation and is more common in adult population. Hypertension is commonly present. In about half of patients, the clinical onset of density deposit disease is preceded by acute infection. In half of patients, the onset is preceded by acute infection and elevated anti-streptolysin in 20 to 40%. The most important presentation is proteinuria. Heavy proteinuria and nephrotic syndrome, usually there is decreased kidney function and hypertension, and in half of patients, in 50% of patients, it is usually preceded by acute infection. 
patient with dense adiposite disease very characteristically may develop what is called ocular drosen. Ocular drosen, which is lipoprotein, lipoproteinaceous deposits, deposits, lipoproteinaceous deposits of complement containing debris complement containing debris within the brush membrane within the brush membrane beneath the retinal pigment epithelium very important what is ocular drosen ocular drosen is very 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 characteristic to dense deposit disease what is ocular drosen is lipoproteinaceous material or lipoproteinaceous deposits within the brush membrane below the retinal pigment epithelium this ocular drosen or, the, or this pathology is similar to what is called age-related macular degeneration but in contrast what is the what is the difference between both the ocular drosen and uh, age-related macular degeneration that the drosen in density deposit disease may be found as early as the second decade of life it is usually an early age but age-related macular degeneration is usually present with an elderly but drosen in density deposit disease is present earlier there is no correlation between the severity of the kidney affection and the affection of the eye another characteristic another characteristic presentation is what is called acquire partial lipodystrophy lipo partial lipodystrophy very characteristic presentation for density deposit disease present in a minority of cases not all of the cases it is a condition with symmetrical loss there is loss of adipose tissue from the face very characteristic face arms and upper portion of the trunk so there is ocular drosen with deposition of debris or deposits below the retinal pigment epithelium and partial lipodystrophy with loss of adipose tissue from the face arms and upper portion of the trunk this is partial lipodystrophy there is loss of adipose tissue and this is ocular drosen these are the lesions these are the deposits these are the deposits very characteristic features very characteristic presentations they can in your clinical life and in exams European board or or fellowship very important very characteristic never forget them what about the outcome the outcome is poor unfortunately the outcome is poor usually 50% of the patients unfortunately will progress to end-stage renal disease within 10 years of diagnosis young females have the greatest risk so the general or the overall outcome is poor 50% will reach in the stage within 10 years with highest risk in young females what about c3 glomerulonephritis it is recently diagnosed c3 glomerulonephritis in a french series 27 percent of patients usually present with nephrotic syndrome two-thirds present with microhematuria and elevated blood pressure and the risk of progression is similar to that of density deposit disease with 50 percent of patients reaching in the stage within 10 years but in common factor H related protein 5 nephropathy which is a familial form in Cyprus 
the major clinical feature is hematuria so in density deposit disease it is usually proteinuria of heavy range or heavy heavy proteinuria and nephrotic syndrome more in density deposit disease but in c3 glomerulonephritis there is also nephrotic syndrome but increased hematuria hematuria here is more and elevated blood pressure and in common factor h related type nephropathy the main the main presentation is hematuria talk about laboratory findings laboratory findings most importantly there is low serum c3 low c3 in the serum which is present in 80 percent of patients with density deposit disease and 50 percent in patient with c3 glomerulonephritis don't forget that in patient with complement factor h related related protein 5 nephro nephropathy serum is serum c3 is normal because here the activation is only in the kidney not in the systemic circulation we described that before in c3 glomerulopathy components of the classic pathway like c1q and c4 are normal don't forget that most patients with density deposit disease are positive positive for C serum C3 nephritic factor, which is the autoantibody, autoantibody that makes C3 convertase more stable or resistant to the function of complement factor H. And we described that before. It is in more than 50% of patients, these antibodies will persist. But as we described also before, C3 nephritic factors are not a specific, are not a specific serological marker for C3 glomerulopathy, as it can happen with MBGN type 1, lupus nephritis, and post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. C3 nephritic factors are present in 40 to 60 percent of cases of C3 glomerulonephritis. Also, methods for measuring c3 nephritic factors are not standardized between different laboratories so the most important is low c3 in the serum and normal c4 and c1q depending on the clinical scenario According to the clinical presentation, it can be possible to prioritize some of the assays to order. For example, in patients with C3 glomerulopathy and low C3 in the serum, low serum C3, in the absence, in the absence of C3 nephritic factor, we can test for anti-common factor H antibodies that the abnormality is in the complement factor H, not in the C3 nephritic factor. And in familial cases of C3 glomerulopathy, we can search for genetic mutations. These are the serological and genetic evaluations for C3 glomerulopathy. What to order? What are the available tests? We'll start by the tests recommended in all patients, in all patients. And there are other tests that can be ordered as a case by case basis. The most important that those tests which are will be requested in all patients. We'll ask in all patients for serum c3 and c4 c3 nephritic factor complement complement h50 and ah50 
measurement of factor H and factor I, serum baroprotein detection, genetic mutations of complement factor H related five protein related protein five nephropathy, and anti factor H antibodies. These will be ordered in all patients with C3 glomerulopathy. But other tests which will be ordered as a case-by-case -case basis are serum factor B and C5 will ask for markers of C3 and C5 activation C3D, DB, soluble C5, B9 or autoantibodies to factor B mutation testing for complement regulatory genes like complement factor H, complement factor I and CD46 and activation protein genes. Very important to know what to order. What about the pathology? We will start by the immune fluorescence, which is the clue, which is the clue for diagnosis. It is the most important. The defining feature of C3 glomerulopathy is the presence of C3, the presence of C3 in, glom in glomeruli on immunohistological examination. This is the this is the most important feature is the presence of C3 in glomeruli in immunohistological staining. In most of the cases, C3 staining is seen on capillary walls and in the mesangium. But in some cases, the staining can be mainly mesangial. In some cases, particularly with dense deposit disease, with dense deposit disease, C3 can C3 staining can be present in the or deposits in Bowman's capsule or tubular basement membrane. But it is mainly in the capillary walls. The defining feature is C3 deposits in the glomeruli. This is an example for C3 deposition or C3 staining for in dense deposit disease. There is widespread staining of the capillary walls and some mesangial staining. Here, here, in the capillary walls. And in some mesangium. Most of staining for C3. What about a light microscopy? A light microscopy, the most common presentation for density deposit disease and C3 glomerulonephritis is MBGN. The most common presentation. As we described in the previous lecture or video about MBGN, that in the older classification of type 2 MBGN, type 2 MBGN is C3 glomerulopathy. So the main presentation in light microscopy is MBGN, membrane proliferative changes with glomerular lobulation and increasing mesangial matrix and capillary wall thickening and double contour formation. But also in some cases, there is might be mesangio proliferative pattern or endocabillary hypercellularity, but the main presentation in light microscopy, of course, is MBGN. This is a glomerulus with MBGN pattern. There is thickening of the glomerular basement membrane, thickening here. Here and increase number of cells in capillary hypercellularity. Here, there is thickening of 
the capillary wall and endocapillary hypercellularity. What about the electron microscopy? The electron microscopy. By definition, as we described earlier, dense deposit disease is characterized by most important most importantly by the presence of the typical osmiophilic osmiophilic dense transformation of the glomerular basement membrane this is the definition of dense deposit disease dense deposit disease is characterized by dense intensely osmiophilic dense transformation of the GBM with similar features can be seen in the Bowman's capsule and tubular basement membrane also in density deposit disease there are typical large electron density in the mesangium can be seen also in the mesangium but this is the most important definition in C3 glomerulonephritis, there is also electron dense material similar, similar to that of dense deposit disease, but without, but without, this is very important, but without such marked electron density that is characterized, that's characteristic for the DDD. So in C3 glomerulonephritis, there is no much intensity or electron density like in dense deposit disease the distinction between dense deposit disease and c3 glomerulonephritis may be may not be of clear cut in both in both dense deposit disease and c3 glomerulonephritis there is sub epithelial hump some epithelial hump shaped deposits very characteristic to know that sub epithelial humps are not pathognomonic for post infectious glomerulonephritis or post streptococcal this is from the differential diagnosis sub epithelial humps can be present in c3 glomerulopathy they are identical to those of post infectious glomerulonephritis This is dense deposit disease. Don't forget, look for the GBM. Look for the transformation. Look for the osmiophilic transformation of the glomerular basement membrane. Don't forget this photo. This, it is very characteristic for dense deposit disease. Very important to know. This is typical osmiophilic transformation of the glomerular basement membrane but in c3 glomerulonephritis there is also electron density position but it is not like this density it is of less intensity and it is it can also present in the mesangium it is also present in the mesangium What about differential diagnosis? We'll talk about glomerulonephritis with dominant, dominant C3, dominant C3. Or what is called glomerulonephritis with dominant C3? What is this pattern we, as we described earlier in the definitions? Diagnosis of C3 glomerulopathy is a straightforward, is a straightforward if there is isolated isolated C3 deposition and typical deposits in electron microscopy isolated what is meant by isolated is that there is no immunoglobulin deposition at all so this is C3 glomerulopathy but some cases have typical appearance of C3 glomerulopathy but have also small amounts of immunoglobulin in the glomeruli we have C3 glomerulopathy and small immunoglobulin deposits deposits so are these 
cases are immunoglobulin and complement due to, for example, post infectious, or they are glomerulonephrites with dominant C3. To define this dominant C3, the most important with the best sensitivity and specificity is the presence of dominant C3 staining, as we said before. And what is what is the definition of dominant? Is staining with C3 intensity intensity of C3 staining at least two orders or more, two orders of magnitude or more than any other immune reactant like IgG or IgM or IgA or C1Q, that the staining for C3 deposition is two or more magnitude more than any other immunoglobulin. So now this is will be termed GM with dominant C3. This is the definition for dominant C3. Dominant if there is C3 deposition and immunoglobulin. Another problem is the distinction between C3 glomerulopathy and post-infectious glomerulonephritis. Post-infectious glomerulonephritis patients have also reduced serum C3, and the, and the glomeruli can stain for C3 without immunoglobulin. It, it can be difficult to differentiate between C3 glomerulopathy and post-infectious glomerulonephritis. In some cases, the distinction can only be done by following by following the patient to see if the resolution of the disease occurs. In post-infectious, it is usually self-limited disease. If there is a response or the patient improved, so it is he is mostly post-infectious glomerulonephritis. So it can be somewhat difficult to differentiate between post-infectious glomerulonephritis and C3 glomerulopathy, as we also described that there is, in both conditions, there is consumed C3. In some cases of post-infectious, the deposition can be mainly C3. And in both conditions, there is sub-epithelial humps. So it can be somewhat difficult to, the, to differentiate between both. What about treatment? According to Kidigo 2020, for C3 glomerulopathy, in the absence of monoclonal gammopathy, C3 glomerulopathy patients with moderate to severe disease can be treated initially, initially with MMF. So our, our initial or first line drug is MMF, and if MMF fails to give a response, Second option is eclozimab. Eclozimab. If the patient didn't respond to both, this patient can be enrolled for a clinical trial where available. So the first line is MMF, second line is eclozimab. To summarize what we have talked about, definition of C3 glomerulopathy is characterized by C3 deposition with no immunoglobulin. The pathogenesis is mainly due to overactivation of the alternative pathway. Types density deposit disease and C3 glomerulonephritis. The main clinical presentations are proteinuria, nephrotic syndrome, hematuria, and impaired kidney function. The overall prognosis is poor with 50% of patients of patients were reached in the stage by 10 years. Pathology in light microscopy, the main presentation is MBGM. Immune fluorescence, which is the clue for diagnosis, is C3 deposition alone with no immunoglobulin. In electron microscopy, is the differentiating point, differentiating point between density deposit disease and C3 glomerulonephritis. Density deposit disease characterized by tense osmophilic density transformation of the GBM. C3 glomerulonephritis is characterized by less electron density than DDD. Treatment is initially can be uh, treated by MMF, and if no response to MMF, eclozimab 
can be an option. Thank you, my dear friends and colleagues, inshallah, to meet in next videos and lectures. Thank you.